Coming up on the program, we'll get some problems with our tomatoes. Something's eating them. We'll figure, what it, figure out what it is and try to fix the problem. And put a lot of tomatoes in a small space without any cages. We'll tell you how we do it. All that and more coming up today on the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener is sponsored in part by For all your non-GMO, heirloom, organic, vegetable, flowers, and herb seeds, visit dollarseed.com. Sue Growing Supply, located in Wausau, Wisconsin, focusing on certified leaf compost, an excellent amendment for poor soil. With their new garden blend, improving soil structure in clay and sandy soil, great for creating new garden beds. Also available from Sue's, pre-filled trays and pots with professional potting soil mix or organic rice hull based potting soil mix. Bag and bulk of certified leaf compost also available. Visit SueGrowingSupply.com. Don't poison your soil with municipal water. Attach a body, mind, and soil hose and filter. Free shipping exclusively through the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com. Just click on the body, mind, and soil icon. Authentic Haven brand, soil conditioner for the home gardener. Easy to brew, 100% organic. Visit ManureTea.com. Rain Reserve. Reserving your rain, preserving our future. Rain Reserve, manufacturing of rainwater capturing capabilities. Visit rainreserve.com and use coupon code RAIN2016 to save 10% on your purchase. Welcome to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener. I'm Joy Baird. We have some problems with our tomatoes. Not what we have had in years past, but we want to get on top of it. Now, this is a Roma tomato that has been ate out. There can be a couple of different uh, reasons why this looks as it does. One can be if you have chickens or uh, come in and they'll peck and tear it apart. We don't have chickens, so that one's not the case. It could be raccoons come in, rip it down, take a big chunk out, and then walk away. Could have holes in it from birds, so those, those are not issues. We've got what we believe is the tomato hornworm. Now, the only thing that, well, we do have one one telltale sign here is right there is a black dropping their manure their byproduct so that's and that's what they'll do they'll eat the tomato as it's ripe or right before it's ripe and then they'll leave their droppings or their casings on the tomato and around the tomato so we've had about three or four of tomatoes be affected by this some of them not concerning to us because they had blossom in rot so it wasn't really a loss to us so they can eat those but we want to get a hold of this before it gets too out of control so one thing you can do is find them look for them we've tried that you can look at it look for them during the daytime they're green with a little horn or a little spike on their head uh, it's hard to find them for us you can also take a flashlight out at night and try to shine on them and they supposedly will kind of glow. I've attempted that challenge and failed at it. Another thing you can use is chemicals, organic or inorganic chemicals, to spray on your tomato plants. BT is the preferred method for us. Uh, you can find that in a powdered form or you can find that in a liquid form. Either way, after rain, reapplication is necessary. So right now we've gone through and we've harvested all the tomatoes that were ripe or nearing ripeness and we've pulled them off the vine right now we're also running our irrigation system on the drip side we don't have to worry too much about it we can just go ahead and spray on the plant and be fine on the side where we have above ground we're going to have to not we're going to have to shut the system off on that because this will wash it off so with each type of chemical or organic Omri listed chemical, you need to follow instructions. That's why they're on the back of the, the container. So what we're going to do here is we're using a concentrate here that requires one, uh, one ounce per three gallons. So we're just going to use one capful per two gallons. So we've kind of done the math and it's a little on the heavy side, but that's okay. Now with any type of chemical or in non-chemical you use, it's your decision, your garden, you're eating this stuff. So 
you make the educated decision for your particular situation and use what you feel is best. So we're going to put a little of this in there. We're going to put the application rate for that in our pump sprayer. We're going to add about one uh, tablespoon of liquid seaweed. That'll just help kind of toughen the leaves in case we might come across spider mites and also increase the sugar levels in the stalk of the tomato. If you want to find more information about that, you can go to our website, thewisconsinvegetablegardener.com, and click on the tomato tab at the top of the page, and it'll be uh, some information will be listed there, as well as we'll use some molasses, and that will help. Uh, this is sorghum molasses, and that will help stimulate the good bacteria on the plant and and all of all of that. So I'm going to mix all this together, and then we'll head out to the tomato patch and start applying this to try to kill the hornworm. And what's going to happen is. This is going to get sprayed on the plant, on the, on the foliage, as well as the fruit. And the concept is the hornworm will eat this, the, take chunks out of it, ingest it, and then it'll, it'll kill them from the inside out. Now, if you have hornworms, I, I explained that uh, this is what the remnants is, but if you see hornworms with white little specks coming off their back, that's from the Brachycan wasp that has laid its larva in it and it looks like this. And if you see that, leave it alone. That worm is good as dead. You've got a very balanced ecosystem in your backyard or in your garden, and that wasp is targeting those worms, laying its eggs in the back of it, and the eggs are feeding internally off the inside of the worm. It's kind of nasty, but that's the way nature works. So I'm gonna put this together, and we're gonna to head to the tomato patch. Okay, so we're up on the high end here. Uh, where the, we got one row of tomatoes, we got seven plants. So now with all of the, all of the uh, ingredients we put in there, the molasses, the liquid seaweed, which is a concentrate, and you can buy that from your local garden center, as well as the spray or the, the chemical for the reducing or trying to control the hornworm, which is an, or, or not quite an organic, but it's not a toxicity that's very high. Again, you want to decide what's best for your growing uh, situation. So what we're going to do here, you want to coat these things. You want to get a mist going on your sprayer, and you can. Uh, you want to coat these. I mean, just absolutely underneath and the whole deal to try to get as all of it covered. So when these worms or other insects that you might have get, you know, bite into them, they get that ingested into them, and they later die. So be sure you cover everything. Go to the bottom. Now there are other ways, you know, you can take a hose and try to blast the tomato plant uh, with water if you think that's where the hornworm is. I've seen people find them or walk out and find them very easily. Another thing that you can do is take a post, a wooden post, and put a tuna can on it that's empty. And inside that tuna can put bird seed and put them, you know, around your tomato plants. And what happens is the birds will the birds know that that's food. They'll come in and they'll land on that and perch there and eat bird seed, as well as they have a keen sense of sight, and they can see these things move around, and they will, uh, most times they'll be able to pull them off the plant, and that's another way to get rid of the hornworm or reduce the numbers of the hornworm without having to go through this procedure of spraying. Now that will be something that we will also try to do as well. You can use bird seed, you could use peanuts in there, something to attract the birds to where they can sit high, perch high, and the, they can see these uh, worms. So, trying to control the hornworms in the tomato patch. Now, after your growing season is over, what you can also do is loosen the soil, dig the soil up where the tomatoes are currently at. Don't plant tomatoes in the same location again. Uh, by disturbing the soil, what occurs is the moth that lays the larva that creates the worm that will morph into the moth, it lays its larva in the soil around the tomato plants, and it stays there throughout the winter. Then in the spring, it turns into the worm and starts eating your plants. So what, uh, or what happens is the larva, it's in the soil, so by disturbing the soil at the end of the season, you're disrupting the level that the, mo the moth has laid in the soil. So it may be too cold or too warm based on what uh, depth you disturb it being. So it's another way that will reduce your chances by about 90% uh, of getting the hornworm. So just some options there when it comes to controlling the hornworm, hoping that you don't have it, but if you do, that's some option. One other thing that you want to keep in mind is if you are seeing the tomato remnants of the tomato hornworm eating your tomatoes, 
try to leave those on the vine, even though they've been ate out. I know it's what the th what I'm what I think would be best would be leave them on the vine, simply because until you catch it or kill it or the bracken bracken wasp lays its larva in it, it's still going to eat your tomatoes. So by leaving the already partially eaten tomatoes on the vine, at least you're giving you're having a chance that it will go back and continue to feed on that ripening tomato and may leave some other ones alone until you can get them to harvest. So that's another thought you might want to keep in mind. Just don't rip them off the vine just because they're damaged. Leave them on there and maybe that they will come back and continue to eat the ones that they've already damaged and ruined and leave your other ones alone. So this is the seed pod to a leek. Now these leeks were planted here a year ago, well approximately 15 months ago, early spring of a, a year ago. And what has happened here is we've uh, let them go, we didn't harvest them, and they put on a seed pod. Now leeks as onions are biannual, which means they grow the first year, go dormant, then start growing again the second year, and that's when their, their production of seeds occurs. So what we can do here, this is the size of a softball. There's literally thousands of seeds here. And what, has, what will occur is if I leave this alone, this will get dry just like uh, paper and the seeds will all drop. I'm wanting to, to not have them drop here. I'm wanting to save these seeds. So what I want to do here, I want to go ahead and trim it just like that. And I can do a couple of things. I can bring this indoors and just set it in, an, in a non-direct sun location and just let it dry as it is. Or the easier way to do is get a paper sack and put it in and it will dry like that. You can forget about it. It'll dry. You do want to check on it, you know, a couple, once a, every couple of weeks. Now the reason why you want a paper sack, and this is the, the number one important key to this whole saving seeds operation is paper is breathable. If you put this in a plastic sack that we all get from our grocery store and big box stores, it can't breathe. It will sweat and it will turn into a giant ball of mold in a matter of a few, uh, probably a week. So keep it in that. You can leave it open if you want to, to leave it, let it breathe a little easier, but it's going to dry out in here. You'll be able to save the seeds and you won't have to buy leek seeds for next year and you'll have plenty. Now leek seeds and onion seeds are relatively uh, viable for about a year. We, we've gotten two years out of them, but you don't want to save these or attempt to say, okay, I'm going to save these for the next 10 years. I'll never, never have to buy leek seeds. That's not going to work. So some of these, you can see that they're getting ready whenever it really opens up. Uh, it's really opened up. This here, this one here is very tightly wove, uh, still very tight. So we're not ready to harvest that one yet. These have opened up. I can harvest them put them in the bag. Uh, this one here, still a little tight than, tighter than I want because it's easier to dry them out here, but I don't want to get, there we go, that one's opened up. I don't want to leave them out here and then I have thousands of leaks in this area. I want to have them placed in a specific location. So we put a lot of tomatoes and we've experimented with this in the past in a small space and that's called intensive planting. Now we've done that without cages and here is what this bed looks like. There is 21 tomatoes in this bed and it is a jungle of tomatoes. We've got Florida weave on two of the three rows simply because I forgot to put it on the third row and the plants got too out of control. But what we've got here is we've got two fence posts on one on each end. Now we've got small posts and we've got big posts. This is T post. That's what the, the farmers use to put around pins out in pastures to, to keep the animals up uh, out. They put, or keep the animals in, they put uh, electric fencing around. T post is the ideal choice of post for this application. And then we've got the flimsier metal post and that's why I've got this little thing here to try to hold things together. But what is happening here is I've got the T post and then I've got strings and I've got two strings here running at equal levels. I've got uh, three sets here. And as these tomato plants grow, we just put them through the string or sometimes they grow outside of the string. And what is happening is the weight of the tomato is resting on the string and the string is mimicking a cage. 
This way you don't have to have cages and you can do a lot of tomatoes in a small area. And this is what the, big, uh, the bigger tomato growers will do. Now, if we look on the side here that I don't have tomatoes on, here's the row I don't have tomato, or the, the row I don't have strings on. You can see they've just kind of done their own thing. You got some laying on the ground, which is not good for tomato productivity. You want to get these things off the ground, you can double your production just by adding, getting them elevated. So it's kind of past the point of no return here. We can't really put strings up. We're just kind of letting them do their own thing, it's, uh, at least on these seven plants. With these 14 over here, we do have strings and they are being supported by those strings. So if you don't want to buy expensive tomato cages or the, even the El Cheapo ones you get on sale at your local home and garden center at the beginning of the season, look at Florida Weaves. A Florida Weave, you can get a lot of tomatoes in a small area with just some string. Now this is agricultural baling twine. You can get uh, a roll of 20,000 feet, that's about six miles worth, for about 30 bucks. And it's a plastic string. This is orange, they come in yellow. You can get natural fibers, but the plastic lasts for many years without biodegrading. So keep that in mind next time, next year when it's time to plant tomatoes. This may be a method that you want to explore. Thanks for watching. Join us again next time for more organic gardening and food production. I'm Joy Barrett, and this has been the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener. For more information, please visit thewisconsinvegetablegardener.com.